Hey everyone, how's it going? It's Russell here, and for many Canadians all across the country, the dream and the potential goal of owning a home seems like it's getting farther and farther away, especially given the price increases we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic, and especially when you compare that to the rather stagnant average wage of the typical Canadian. And I'm saying this as a realtor who could potentially gain from this dramatic increase in housing prices, but this is definitely a problem that we need to solve, and it's caused some rather interesting headlines. Take a look at this. It says the second second largest country in the world, that's Canada, is running out of land. The Canadian dream of a house with a yard is becoming unaffordable as real estate prices surge and space to build runs short. Now, reading that headline, you might be saying, hey, Russell, that's a little bit interesting. How could we be running out of space when Canada is the second largest country in the world? Something doesn't quite add up here. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about today in this video. You see, there are some things going on behind the scenes that are making this crisis even worse and some certain political policies that could be pumping up real estate prices with no or little regard for the people who are struggling because of this largely low income and middle class Canadians. We're gonna talk about what politicians have been saying lately, what the Bank of Canada, the Canada Central Bank has been saying, as well as if there's anyone even out there who's trying to do anything to solve this problem. But before we get into the details, Details, make sure to check out the link in the description where you can get 45% off the Canada Money Mastery Program where we teach everything you should have learned about money back in high school, how to earn more, save more, and funnel that into the right type of investment to get you closer to retirement earlier than you thought possible. So check out that link in the description and see if it's a good fit for you. All right, let's get into these details. Let me provide a little bit of context for you. Way back at the beginning of the pandemic, the Bank of Canada started artificially lowering interest rates through something called their Quantitative Easing Program. This made it way cheaper to get a mortgage and way easier to afford a larger home. Now, on top of all of this, it also allowed for the big banks that give those mortgages to be able to give out more mortgages than they were before because they lowered something called the capital reserve requirements. Essentially, this just means that big banks were able to give out bigger mortgages to more people more frequently. And this is all thanks to the Bank of Canada essentially printing billions of dollars every single week through this quantitative easing program. But if you ask the governor of the Bank of Canada, Tiff Macklem, if this is the reason that we're seeing this housing price increase, he'll have a different answer for you. Let me show you what he said just last week. We're all spending a lot of time at home and Canadians want more space. Uh, and that is the fundamental factor that is driving uh, this, you know, with this very sudden shift in demand, supply is having trouble keeping up. And there's no question low interest rates are making uh, borrowing more affordable. Uh, and so that is part of it. So our guy Tiff Macklem at the Bank of Canada says he does acknowledge that interest rates are driving up real estate prices, but he still thinks that this market is currently based on fundamentals, just supply and demand dynamics. We're saying, hey, there's not enough houses and there's too many people who want houses, so that's going to drive up the price. And while I think he underplays the effect that the Bank of Canada has on real estate prices, it likely is a combination of both of these factors, right? This low for long interest rate policy that we have, as well as the basic supply and demand market fundamentals. And this uh, supply and demand idea is also echoed by a conservative politician, Pierre Poilievre. Just a couple days ago, one of my favorite YouTubers, Steve Soretsky here on YouTube, another Canadian realtor based out on the West Coast, well, he actually had Pierre Poilievre on an interview. I really recommend recommend you check it out. There's going to be a link to that interview in the description of this video. But Pierre says some interesting things that kind of align with what the Bank of Canada is saying here in some respects, even though he's traditionally given Tiff Macklem a rather high, hard time, especially when uh, Tiff Macklem has spoken in finance committee meetings that the government has held. He actually provides some comments on that first headline I showed you. Remember where they said, hey, Canada's running out of space for houses and how this doesn't really make the most sense given the size of Canada. Let me show you exactly what Pierre said. The, the issue is not the number of people, it's the number of houses. <laughs> we have room. <laughs> we have more room than any other country on earth. The problem is we're not allowed to build on it. We can't get anything done in this country. You know, it takes 167 days longer to get a building permit for a warehouse in Toronto than it does in the United States. It, we are ranked 36 out of 37 OECD nations for the delay times to, to get a building permit. We are one of the slowest places in the developed world to get anything built, including and especially housing. And that is the problem. It is not a population problem. Uh, it is a very simply a problem of gatekeepers blocking construction while central banks print money and, st and stoke demand. 
So it's clear that Pierre Poilievre is making the point that, hey, we have a big country, we just need to incentivize more people to build, and if we can increase that supply of houses, well then, housing prices will go down and it'll be more accessible to more people to get into a home, right? More homes, uh, same amount of people, it's gonna lower prices, the supply and demand dynamics that everyone's been talking about. But what you may not know, and this is where things get a little bit interesting, is that across Canada, many different provinces actively have policies that disincentivize people from building new homes and expanding. Let me show you what I'm talking about here, and I'm going to use Ontario as an example because that's where I'm from, but if you look for your individual province or territory, there's likely some similar policies in place. And this is from a document entitled A Place to Grow. It reminds me of the good things grow in Ontario. Anyone who lives here knows what I'm talking about. But this is actually the official growth plan for the province of Ontario that outlines how they want to grow, how they want to expand, what they're going to allow in terms of that growth. And I think you'll find it a little bit interesting. And this is in a section of the document that says guiding principles or the things they want to take into consideration every step along the way. And they say here they want to prioritize intensification and higher densities in strategic growth areas to make efficient use of land and infrastructure and support transit viability. And we'll pair that with another uh, guiding principle here that I want to show you. And that's they want, they want to integrate climate change considerations into planning and managing growth, such as planning for more resilient communities and infrastructure that are adaptive to the impacts of a change in climate and moving towards environmentally sustainable communities by incorporating approaches to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now that gets a little bit off of topic of what we're talking about here today, but let me provide a little bit of context on why I think these two points are so important. When they say that they want to prioritize intensification, essentially they want to take already created cities, already created towns, and instead of allowing different communities and suburbs and um, the different homes to be sort of sprawl out, right, urban sprawl, instead they want to intensify into one like downtown area, making more and more densely populated areas across Ontario. That means that any policy that they put in here is supposed to actively work towards that, right? Instead of incentivizing a sprawl and the creation of these new homes, instead they'd be more likely to fund like an apartment building to go up because that's far higher density, more people living in a smaller space. Now there are a lot of positive points to this urban intensification idea that Ontario is trying to push here alongside a bunch of other provinces as well who have similar policies in place. For one, it makes it easier to facilitate transit for the different communities, right? If you have more people living in a smaller place, well, that bus or that train doesn't need to go to as many different places. It can also help with traffic, right? If you have a large sprawl and people spreading out, well, you're going to have more congestion as they drive into the city for their jobs, as well as the environmental concerns, right? If we have a continuously sprawling population, well, then certain forests and certain environmental zones could be impacted by that urban sprawl. But there are definitely some negative consequences to policies like this, largely home prices and rent prices. If you have more and more people living in more densely populated areas, well, of course, home prices are going to go up. There's more demand for homes. Of course, rent prices are going to go up. There's more demand for rent because everyone's incentivized through these policies to live in a smaller community, at least in terms of square footage, right? Smaller community in terms of size, but higher community or larger community in terms of the amount of people actually living there. And that leads to the age old debate. Should we allow the free market to expand as it wishes and develop more and more areas, potentially making it more affordable for Canadians to live? Or do we want to prioritize the environment in, in some ways, as well as having a proper infrastructure that can actually support that amount of people? That's not something I'm gonna answer here in this video. I like to stay down the middle as much as I can, but it's something that you should at least start thinking about. But what, you may ask, is Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, along with his Liberal government, doing about this housing issue? Well, the short answer is not a whole heck of a lot. You see, they implemented a, a tax on certain vacant units, housing units, um, but this likely isn't going to make a big effect on the housing market and lower prices to make things more affordable for Canadians. And it's just sort of trying to generate a little bit of extra revenue, but I don't think it's gonna make any big impact. But they do have an, a plan in here to create create more houses, sort of trying to address this supply and demand issue. And they outlined that plan in the recent budget that was released just about a month ago. And let me show you what it says. They say they're acknowledging here that high housing costs, especially in urban centers, continue to place middle-class and low-income Canadians under huge financial pressure. For some, high housing costs have become a barrier to pursuing promising opportunities in a new community, and housing unaffordability can even lead to homelessness, obviously. As of 2018, more than 1.6 million Canadian households live in core housing need. 
So they said, hey, we recognize there's a problem here, but what are they actually going to do about it? Well, they talk a little bit about that down here a little bit farther. They say, that's why the government has a plan to invest 2.5 billion and reallocate 1.3 billion in existing funding to speed up the construction, repair, or support of 35,000 affordable housing units, affordable housing units specifically. Th this is a little bit interesting. Let me tell you why. I'm definitely glad that they're trying to provide affordable housing units that should serve the most at-risk people, people who are struggling with home homelessness and extreme low incomes, right? That's what these affordable housing units are for. But in terms of the overall affordability for the housing market, I really don't think that this plan or anything inside of the budget is going to do anything about it, right? They said they're going to make 35,000 new affordable housing units. Well, that's just a drop in the bucket of the roughly 14 million, over 14 million housing units in Canada. When you think about a supply and demand uh, function, well, is that really going to do anything? It's just a drop in the bucket. I don't think that this plan is really going to change all that much when it comes to housing. But hey, I've been wrong before and I'm always interested in different perspectives and what people think about this. So I'm going to encourage you to comment down below in the comment section. I read every single one and I want to know, do you more align with what Pierre Poilievre is saying here? Like open it up to the free markets. We can expand, create more housing, maybe solve the housing affordability problem with that. Or do you think that the liberals plan is the right way to go? Or do you think that all of the blame lands squarely on the shoulders of the Bank of Canada with their incredibly low interest rates and their money printing? I'm interested in any of your thoughts, so let me know down there in the comment section. And make sure to use coupon code INVEST to get 45% off the Canada Money Mastery Program. The link is down there in the description. We teach everything about money that you should have been taught back in high school, including a section on house hacking, which I think is one of the best ways not only to save up for a home uh, quicker to get to that down payment, but also how you can actually use your home to make you a little bit of money and set you up for an even better financial future. So if that sounds like a good fit for you, make sure to check that out. And with all that said, thank you so much for watching everybody. I really hope this video helped you out at least a little bit and I'll see you next time. This channel is supported by viewers like you. Thanks channel members.